Hello and welcome. I'm Andrew Richard Albany, Senior Writer here at Publishers Weekly, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the second installment of our Live from the Library Lounge web series, where today we'll be talking about digital content and libraries. Before we get going, I'd like to shout out our sponsor for today's talk, Overdrive. And if you're here with us on a webinar about digital content and libraries, you all certainly know about Overdrive, the pioneering uh, leading digital provider to libraries and schools. They have the Libby app, the Sora app. And on a personal level, uh, I can say Overdrive has always been a strong supporter of the mission of public libraries and schools, and they've always been eager to encourage discussions like the one that we're going to have today. So uh, to the fine people at Overdrive, I wanna thank you for uh, your support for this conversation today and for your support for our public libraries and schools. You know, we're here today because we need to talk about digital content in libraries. That's eBooks and digital audio, about streaming services, about all of these things. And this is not a new topic, of course. You know, librarians and publishers, we've been talking about this subject, and I've been writing and reporting on it for well over a decade. So what makes the conversation that we want to start today important and different? Well, obviously, the pandemic. Uh, over the last decade, it's fair to say that the major publishers, at least, have approached digital reading in libraries cautiously to be diplomatic about it. But when libraries and bookstores and schools around the country began shutting their doors back in March, digital access suddenly took on much greater importance and demand and usage of digital resources in libraries has surged. So let me briefly set the stage for today's talk. It was just January of this year, uh, about 10 years ago, all right, 10 months ago, but it feels like 10 years, when Macmillan CEO John Sargent, John Sargent stood before a meeting room full of librarians at the ALA Midwinter Meeting in Philadelphia and told them that an embargo on new release ebooks in libraries was necessary because the growth rate of library ebook lending was poised to throw the publishing ecosystem out of balance. Now, Macmillan was alone in its embargo policy at the time, but not in a lot of its assumptions. In fact, in the last two years, four of the big five publishers uh, have changed their access terms, their licensing terms, and their pricing for digital content in public libraries. Notably also in his talk in January, Sargent also told librarians that the company would take a look at the data from the first few months of the embargo and around March or April would reevaluate their position. But on March 17th, when the reality of the pandemic was finally becoming clear, Macmillan pulled the plug. They abruptly abandoned the embargo. And whether or not that reevaluation in Macmillan ever happened, we just don't know. What we do know is that the pandemic hit and digital content became a necessity and dozens of publishers began slashing prices and easing restrictions on digital content and library eBooks. And that's no small thing. On, on behalf of readers and on behalf of the you know, parents of young readers everywhere, uh, let me say thank you to all the publishers and the aggregators, including our sponsor today, who made their catalogs more affordable or less unaffordable, should I say, during this time, who made their collections free, they're cheap, and, and it, who helped libraries serve their communities by relaxing their terms and easing prices. Uh, again, I want to say thank you. What I've consistently heard from librarians over the last seven months is that these changes have made a real difference. But librarians have also told me that the digital library market needs more than a pandemic sale. And of course, the pandemic is far from over. So today, you know, we want to start talking about what comes next. Even though we still have a ways to go before we get our arms around this thing, it's not too early to start thinking about what this forced experiment in the digital library market is telling us. You know, what happens when we put this pandemic behind us? And I ask that because it strikes me that we just can't return to the pre-pandemic normal. And with that, I'm going to introduce our panel today. Uh, joining us today, we have Lisa Rosenblum, who's the director of the King County Library System in Washington State, one of the busiest library systems in the country. And King County is consistently one of the nation's leaders in digital circulations. Welcome, Lisa. Ramiro Salazar is the director of the San Antonio Public Library. Uh, he has been in that position for 15 years, serving almost 2 million residents in San Antonio and Bayer County. He is also the immediate past president of the Public Library Association. Welcome, Ramiro. Kelvin Watson is the director of the Broward County Libraries in Florida. Kelvin was named the 2019 Librarian of the Year by the Florida Library Association, and in 2016 was the inaugural winner of the ALA's Ernest A. DiMattia Award for Innovation and Service to the Community and Profession. And welcome, Kelvin. 
Uh, and Kathy Zapatello is the executive director of the Conneaut Public Library in Ohio, and she is the 2021 president of the Association for Rural and Small Libraries. Kathy has worked for 17 years in Ohio libraries, and we're delighted to have Kathy here, not only because she's terrific, but because the perspectives of smaller libraries are often left out of this discussion on digital content. I've noticed that hole in my own coverage, something we're now resolved to, to, to correct. And joining me today as moderator is Sari Feldman. My friend and colleague is a valued PW columnist since 2017. Sari probably needs no introduction, but I'm gonna introduce her anyway. She's the former director of the Cuyahoga County Public Library in Cleveland, Ohio, a former president of both the Public Library Association and the American Library Association. And she knows this issue well. She, was, she served as the first co-chair of the ALA's Digital Content Working Group from 2012 to 2014, and as an ALA policy fellow on this issue. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, and with that, I'm going to toss it over to Sari for our the first part of our discussion. Sari. Hi, everyone, and uh, everyone out there watching. And thank you so much for being here with us today. So um, to get us started, I want to have each of you talk a little about digital usage in your libraries. What was it like prior to the pandemic? Uh, I know usage is rising at the start of usage was rising at the start of 2020, but how much um, and how much how are you managing the cost and demand and how much has usage and demand risen since the pandemic began? Because we know that that is a big topic of conversation. And how are you managing that? And I think um, we'll start with Kathy to tell us a little bit about that. Thank you. So first of all, let me say thank you to Overdrive and, you know, uh, talk about SOAR and the Libby app and all of those things. Fabulous. Waiving those fees for public libraries to be able to get our patrons on board. But that's really where I want to start. Um, it's because of those enhancements that I know my library was, you know, able to take advantage of. Um, we were able to add borrowers online during the pandemic, something that my small library hadn't done. And when I look at those numbers, since March, my tiny little library in Conneaut, Ohio, we're gaining about four new borrowers a month that never had a library card, uh, but now want to access our online resources. And so when I looked at that nationally, hold on to your, to your seats here, folks. Um, when we look at March to March, that's an increase of 222% nationally. Those are new borrowers um, accessing OverDrive. So let's think about that. Where did they come from before? Um, we're pulling them from other markets. So I think that's a great place to really um, think about these statistics. And then checkouts. I surveyed my, my membership for, for ARSL, our Association for Rural and Small Libraries. And there's some outliers in that data that I received back, but basically I'm hearing a 30% increase in circulation of eBooks and audiobooks. And so um, again, that's in line nationally and that's at 43% right now nationally as far as checkout goes. So we're seeing these resources obviously, you know, come into great demand, but I can't have that conversation with my member libraries until we talk about the digital divide a little bit as well. So, you know, that's going to be kind of my mantra through this conversation is that we, you know, we have folks that need to be able to get on the internet and get devices all across the United States to even be able to engage in this form of, of reading. So that's something that I know that I will be looking at. We'll go from a small to a really large library. So Lisa, you want to jump in and tell us a little bit about what's happening in King County. Well, your your numbers are better than mine. Um, we saw actually a 42% increase in digital circulation between um, this year, this time last year and this time this year. We uh, immediately, when the pandemic hit, we knew we were just in a different world. So we've already always had uh, digital cards. So note to libraries out there be prepared we saw a 300 we had 333 percent increase in applications for digital cards uh between uh march of 2019 and now so um, we've really gone up people are discovering our digital and it's hard to believe which because we have such a big digital presence in king county that we could get even more, but there were still some people who didn't know. 
We provided digital content. My favorite story is of a truck driver whose wife discovered our digital content and said we've saved her hundreds of dollars a year because her husband just listens to our, downloads our books onto his iPhone or whatever digital device and drives away. Um, I will say in, in fairness to our sponsor, Overdrive, we've also seen a 30% increase in overdrive growth over this time. But what we did was we moved um, all of our money that we were spending on books and we immediately moved it into digital. And we did that for a couple months. So we really amped up our, our digital and our figures for next year, 50% of all of our spending is gonna be in digital because we know we're in the year of COVID. We're not gonna go back into buildings. And even if we are, we're seeing decreases in print because people are using their libraries in a different way. So that's where that's where we are. And Kelvin, what what's what's up for you? Okay, so for us, um, very similar to some of the things that, that Lisa actually mentioned, but our digital uses has jumped since the pandemic. Uh, we're at an overall average of about nineteen percent increase in the uses for all our digital resources. Our overdrive. Uh, has increased uh, that usage by about 23%. We also have Access 360, which has increased 58%, Frigo Music 14%, and Hoopla 33%. With most of our offerings, we've seen this, uh, we've seen a substantial increase in unique users as well. Um, we already had a digital library card, a digital library card offering for some time, uh, about Three and a half years ago, we introduced a digital direct library card for the uh, 300,000 uh, school students we have here in Broward County. And so um, we have about 80,000 active uh, of, of those library card. Um, so while Hoopla, as I mentioned, has we've actually had uh, a 200% increase of new unique users to that service. Um, and our other digital services that I haven't talked about have seen an increase of about 16, 16 to 68%. Um, before the pandemic, we had been seeing similar increases uh, year over year since I arrived in 2017 for our digital resources. Um, the, the outlier or the exception has been Access 360, which is our primary children's and youth platform. As I mentioned, we saw a 58% increase there. Um, you know, some of the things that we've seen or we, um, I guess we kind of appreciate, I know we're going to talk uh, even more is, you know, this, the pandemic pricing has helped us some. Uh, we certainly hope that this, uh, the, this pricing and things continue. Um, but it has allowed us to purchase more licenses of hot titles to try to meet the needs of our customers and reduce the number of holds and wait time. Uh, when Macmillan um, introduced their embargo, we moved uh, forward with reducing our loan period of those resources from 21 days to 14 days. We still have that actually in place. And honestly, this has helped us with our circulation of ebooks and, and audio books. Um, we're continuing to keep an eye on the, on the pricing. And as a, um, uh, as a as the current one of the, the current co-chairs of the digital, digital content working group, we are also uh, you know, having similar conversations and planning on um, extending the conversation to the publishers that we need something permanent sustainable and not have, um, you know, not have us go back and back to uh, what it was before uh, the pandemic uh, hit. And Romero. W. Can you hear me? Yes. So uh, thank you for this opportunity. So the ex experience here at San Antonio Public Library is similar to my colleagues. Um, prior to the pandemic, we were experiencing about an 18% increase in digital content demand um, after we had to shutter the doors and then rely solely on um, offering digital content. Uh, we're now at about 38% increase from the previous year. 
so it continues, the demand for digital content continues to increase. Um, obviously, we've had to do some balancing, uh, but that's the experience here in San Antonio, uh, very similar with uh, other libraries uh, participating in this uh, session. Thank you. So, Romero, I'm going to have you continue speaking. Um, I'm jumping the questions. I'm reordering the questions. Uh, Calvin opened the door to talk a little bit about, you know, what might happen. Um, the publishers have given these temporary breaks in prices and access restrictions. But have you heard from major publishers? What might we see happening um, after the pandemic? Uh, what should happen? And you know, we're, we've been dependent on the publishers, and now we're increasingly dependent because more people are viewing the library as the gateway to digital content. So um, what would you tell the publishers if um, you were in a Zoom call with them today? Well, first of all, the que your first question, have I heard from any publishers? Yeah. No, none directly uh, have reached out to me. Do I do want to acknowledge and recognize St Steve Potash with Overdrive. He has reached out directly to me and offered uh, his assistance in helping uh, the San Antonio Public Library uh, respond to to demand, and he has been working very closely with our team to create opportunities to facilitate access to uh, e-content. Uh, so I want to commend because he needs to be commended uh, for his efforts. Um, in terms of what would I tell publishers? Well, it's not that the future is here. It, it's pretty obvious that the Having access, providing access to digital content, it's extremely important, especially now uh, in this pandemic, to serve and respond to community needs. It also speaks from my perspective that this uh, will continue even after the pandemic, because I know that there will be an after, um, that, there, that there will continue to be a demand. We, I reported earlier that prior to, to March, we were experiencing an increase um, and then the pandemic hit and, and the increase got larger, the demand got larger. Uh, so the, I think that trend will continue. And so for publishers of e-content, my message to them is that the demand will continue to, to increase and we need their help to help make e-content more affordable and more accessible because libraries will be faced with with very difficult decisions on how, how to balance the demand for e-content and the demand for physical items. And uh, it's something that I'm not looking forward to in, look, looking forward to in terms of uh, that particular challenge. Uh, so publishers can engage libraries now and library leaders to, uh, to come up with models that, uh, that can um, benefit both parties. Uh, so that's the message I would uh, delivered to uh, the publishers. And Kelvin, you opened the door on this conversation, and you've had a leadership role for the American Library Association in considering um, the future of digital content and access, and I know broader than public libraries, but what would you say to publishers if you were sitting at the table with them right now? Well, first of all, um, since we're we're doing the the, uh, the thanks to Overdrive and Steve Potash, I'll do the same at this time as Ramiro as Ramiro did. I actually did hear from um, Steve as well um, as we kind of went through um, early on in the uh, in in the crisis. Um, I also have not heard uh, from any of uh, from any of the publishers as as well. Um, you know what I would tell. Publishers is pretty much what I what I said in in a, a uh, an article uh, or that I wrote for uh, Library Journal, and and that is that library that that um, publishers need to acknowledge uh, that um, libraries have a critical role in this information ecosystem and broader for society and the publishers. And that they should respect libraries and for our public good, um, 
and that the um, that we need to come up with models that work for libraries that work for publishers as well. We're not, you know, we're not enemies in this. Um, libraries are uh, benefiting our customers, the patrons, the people that use these these resources. As this, as our as my colleagues have already said, more and more people are are using them. There's an increasing preference for digital content. We've introduced more people to digital content since they are staying at home, sheltered in place, you know, doing the social distancing that they're doing. We need to find ways to make our digital, this is libraries, our digital collections robust and lasting. And that requires the publishers to be uh, at the table and reaching out to us, as Ramiro said, reaching out to library leaders, reaching out to um, the ALA, reaching out to PLA, uh, ULC, others, so that we can meet the ever uh, increasing demand and provide equity of access to this content and these resources to the communities that we serve. And um, Lisa, you've been uh, no shrinking violet when it comes to <laughs> talking to publishers, which is something that has uh, garnered great affection uh, among those who are uh, very invested in the future of this. So uh, what, what would you say now as King County in many ways has become at least temporarily a digital library? So what would you say to them now? Well, I mean, I, I don't want to repeat what my colleague said, but we're in this together. We help each other out. We push content. I mean, and again, like during the, um, the just horrific racial unrest we've experienced since, well, for a long time, but in June, um, digital contact, thanks to Steve and some other publishers, was provided to us on topics of importance of racial injustice uh, in, a, in a much um, uh, less expensive form. We had simultaneous use and we people were reading and reading and reading these topics. It was important to our public to be able to read and to learn. And this is a wonderful thing that our country can do and libraries can do to provide a critical needs in society, this access online uh, to, these, to this content. But I would also say, um, there's a lot of companies out there that are making a lot of money right now. Amazon, I'm talking to you. And um, I'd like to see kind of a, a, a Carnegie support for libraries. Why can't, you know, there be a, uh, a push to provide all of us partner with the publishers, give them a bunch of money to provide content for libraries so we can uh, educate our public and offer this for our rural libraries and our big systems such as King County. There needs to be a social good out there to come from all of this. And there's no reason why these companies that have made billions and billions of dollars off this off this pandemic can't give back and give back to your public library because we are open. We never close. We're open digitally. You can still walk into some of our libraries and get on the internet. We're doing curbside books for people and children who need print books. We are there. So I'd, I'd like, I just like to, that thought out there that there's there's no no reason why we can't have this partnership and everybody can win here. And Kathy, um, you know, neglect of small and rural libraries is not the theme of this conversation, but I would imagine um, you don't often have the opportunity for direct conversation with publishers, but say a few words on behalf of the libraries you represent. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and we want to be a part of the conversation. And so um, hopefully this is a, a foray into that. But um, back to my statistics, something that I think is very interesting is juvenile and young adult content is the number one thing that's circling right now. So our new users that we talked about earlier, you know, it's, it's our young users. And that's the future of the library. They're checking out adult or young adult nonfiction and juvenile nonfiction at the rate of it's up 129% in one case and 141% the other case. So this is national. 
this is the future. These are our these are our young people, and it is time for a stronger partnership with public libraries in general and publishers. We have the data. We're great partners. So let us help you, right? There isn't any reason in the world why a, a business like Lisa is talking about to that magnitude wouldn't be taking into account all of the data. That's the way that we do our job. So I would assume that you know they would want all of this data as well. And you know us, we're very transparent and we like to get all that information out there. So I'm just, I'm waiting to be asked. But you know, the other thing I think publishers should be aware of is if I were in a business that was moving all online, I would be uh, part of the revolution to get internet access to every little corner of this country. So wouldn't it be great if you know that partnership even went farther out into our communities, past the public libraries, and right in to the table, the people that are making decisions right now um, to bring broadband. I like that message. Thank you for that, because uh, urban areas need it as well. Urban areas don't have the coverage they need as yeah. well. Um, just, a, a, you know, I'm not in a library anymore, I'm retired. And one of the things I've been really curious about is, okay, so people have become dependent on digital content, whether your library has reopened or is offering curbside service, um, and a lot of new digital users, but do you think it's gonna stick? Do you think this is a trajectory that will continue into the future. People who kind of signed on digitally are going to stay with it and it will just, the momentum will continue now. Um, what do you think? Anyone just jump in. Romero, you're nodding yes. your head. What do I'll you think? I'll jump in because this is something I've been saying in other webinars uh, that uh, often when I would be out in the community, I would get a certain number of individuals that would approach me um, and said, look, I'd like the physical book. I like the way it feels. I like the way it smells. Uh, so, so, you know, I'm a user of physical books and I'm not going to try ebooks. So, with now with the pandemic and those individuals having no option but to turn to ebooks to digital content, uh, I'm convinced that some percentage of those individuals will convert to uh, ebooks. Uh, they will recognize the convenience. They don't have to worry about returning the item back, about uh, fines, though many libraries are doing away with fines. Um, so I, I believe that there will be uh, converts, is what I'm calling them, calling them. Uh, but I have, obviously, it's not based on any, any research or any data, uh, but I'm convinced that will happen. And Sari, I, I would add that, um, you know, it gets dark here early, uh, four o'clock, it gets dark here. And what we found is that our seniors in particular, who we're now teaching how to use online, a lot of our questions the first couple months, because we always had um, our, our, our phone services and our chat, were how do I download a book? How do I use this Kindle that my son gave me. By the way, sons, don't give your parents old Kindles. That's not a that's a bad thing. Buy them a new one or um, whatever reading device. And what we're finding is that our seniors have discovered reading books and our book discussion groups, which are on Zoom, and they like it. And I don't see them when it turns dark at four o'clock wanting to get into their car to drive to their library in the rain in the dark. I, I think our Zoom. Um, programs are going to stick, and that includes reading the book online and also discussing the book uh, virtually. So I think what we're going to find in our public libraries, once we're done with this, is we're going to be offering hybrid services now. We're not going to assume anymore that now nah, people are going to want to come in to discuss. No, maybe they want to discuss it from the warmth of their home and their fire. So that's, we're very open right now when we're done with this pandemic to offer these hybrid services. Anyone yeah. else want to jump in on this? I'll, I'll jump in and say and say yes, uh, certainly um, uh, ditto this this hybrid model. But uh, for for those on the panel that you know that, that work with me and know me for years, we've been in this paradigm shift already. This has already been happening. What happened uh, with COVID was it just sped up. <laughs> That's it. Um, you know, so 
I've been pushing this virtual library concept outside of the the physical buildings, leveraging our digital resources for years. Within the last couple of years, pre-COVID, we had already launched a digital library, uh, all digital library location at our airport. We put digital, we put eBooks on our buses. We were, we're offering um, digital uh, resources, eBooks and audio books at, at, at the hospitals and medical facilities. And so again, COVID just increased that uh, that conversion that that that, that Ramiro talks about the the convert uh, for people who say that they hadn't you know used ebooks for example but really the data had already showed us that people were increasingly using uh, audio books uh, as as well so the trend um, is not that we're going to go backwards uh, but certainly uh, we're going to uh, see this uses is use. Um, definitely uh, continue to grow exponentially. Kathy? Well, you know, I worry about the, the budgets of our small libraries because, you know, I'm, I'm listening and, and it's in my mind, I'm hearing yes and, yes and, you know, yes and, right? So we have digital services. We've watched these in, in, enhance and increase and obviously it has been sped up. But, you know, for, for those in the small and rural libraries, we, you know, we still have the same budget or less than budgets. And now we have another and that we're putting on our plate. And because, you know, when I even look at our, our tangible items and the circ that's been going on since the pandemic, you know, we're holding our own with, with, with our regular circulating items. So in my library and in smaller ones that I've talked to, you know, we have, it's not so much as a, a, a shift. So, you know, we're looking for, you know, more. We're looking for more money and more resources so that we can facilitate all of the needs of our patrons. Great, thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, as library buildings continue to remain shuttered or even when they open, have some limited services, um, what, you know, what will be the future of uh, discoverability? We've drawn a line with publishers saying we're the place of discoverability. And how is that going to happen? Um, will we see a renaissance of one of my favorite librarianship skills, which is reader's advisory? You know, will that be uh, something very important as is personalized delivery? So Kathy, you wanna talk a little bit about that? Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> You know, um, this is a, the Reader's Advisory. This is something very interesting. So we closed our door doors on March 13th and we locked the doors to the public and I put big post-its around the library and I said, okay, let's brainstorm all of our regular patrons, you know, while we were running reports and doing other things. So we literally, we came up with, with you know, all of these names and we divided them up and we started reaching out to them immediately. And that's what Curbside grew from. So we've been serving these patrons ever since we shut our doors and we've built really interesting relationships, and we were able to take a deeper dive into Reader's Advisory. And then again, um, a small library that's part of a very large consortium in Northeast Ohio, when all of a sudden you're no longer sharing, you no longer have daily delivery, and now my collection that I built around a shared collection is no longer being shared. So now I've got to dig into my stacks and get my own books into their hands. It's been fun, and I can't wait to take a deeper dive. Good for you. Good for you. And um, Lisa, I know Reader's Advisory and serving customers has been a big part of your um, reading service. Yeah, we're continuing to do these curated lists. Um, people can tell us what they're interested in and then we'll push it out. We, of course, are doing that with curbside, but we also have always done that um, digitally. Um, I, I think we need I think you're, you sort of touched on this, but I want to expand. I think we need to get better at it. I think we need to accept the fact that there's going to be uh, a digital world now that's pretty significant. And we need to transfer our skills that we learned uh, with a print world and move it over into a digital world. And um, I think we're doing that really well here at King County, but I think we need to do it uh, more and more recognizing that there is something about you know serendipity. You walk into your library, you're in, the you know historical fiction area. You pick out a couple books. Uh, we need to have that same kind of serendipity uh, online. Romero. Yes. Kelvin. Yeah. Romero. Well, go yeah, ahead. I do have some. Uh, so that 
connection, whether the question is, as I understand it, if libraries will continue to be that connection and a place for discovery, yes. But uh, as Lisa indicated, we have to be very creative and innovative. One of the challenges that uh, I have posed to our library team is because there's there's a huge, significant demand for people. They want to come back into the buildings, and, and browsing is very important. So uh, one of the challenges that I see is how can we create an enhanced virtual experience for the user to simulate a browsing experience, a physical browsing experience. And I know it cannot be done completely, but I, I believe through innovative and creative approaches that there must be ways that we can uh, make the virtual browsing more exciting. And, and so that's one of the challenges. So this virtual environment that we find ourselves in, as Lisa indicated, it has forced libraries to um, develop new skill sets and identify skill sets that need further development in, in our teams, respective teams, so that we can be more effective in a virtual environment. So it's really transforming uh, how we approach that connection, that sense of discovery, uh, and enhancing the customer experience virtually. How can we make it exciting? Uh, I, I see that as a challenge. Uh, I don't think all the answers are here yet, uh, but that's part of the future for, for libraries from my perspective. Yeah, I, and I'm, uh, a lot of has already been said, so I don't want to. I won't necessarily repeat it. I totally agree. You know, moving the online readers of advisory, leveraging social media, the digital assets and tools that we have, pushing, um, you know, pushing content is what I, you know, definitely what I would say via our apps. Uh, one other way that we should be doing this, or the way that we're doing it here in Broward, and libraries can continue to do this, is combining uh, readers' advisory uh, resources with our programming that we offer, not just digitally, but the programming that we're one day going to soon again be able to offer inside um, in, in inside our libraries. Um, the other thing that we do, Romero said, be creative. Um, so I started a book discussion, uh, director's book discussion, where I uh, not only discuss the book, but I talk about other uh, books that would be of interest to people. And we actually combined it um, with uh, with having a, a, a wine uh, during the evening. So I hold these things some some evenings, and we're we're drinking wine and discussing uh, discussing books. So those are ways to you know engage and. Um, you know, with with uh, with our customers. Sounds great. So, Kelvin, are there things? Uh, this is not a prepared question, but I'm curious about: Are there things you wish your staff knew or could be trained <laughs> in? Because you know, the work overnight, March 13th, New York Public Library closed. I was walking down the street. So, um, what uh, what are some of the things that we might consider for the future of library and information education? Um, what I would say is that uh, there's a lot to say, but some of the things that I hone in on would be around staff having to really become content creators. Um, also learning how to use uh, tools that uh, some, frankly, had been reluctant to learn how to use um, in, you know, in filming uh, book discussions and using social media, um, having um, having book discussions and being moderators. Um, so some of the um, uh, speaking skills that uh, the staff may not have uh, developed, they have had to use. Um, there's a ton of content that um, certainly that's available, but you know we had to move our uh, physical programming online at, and, and, and pivot uh, quickly to to do that. And um, and and, you know, so that those are a few things that come straight to mind is that, you know, in in uh, if, if I was uh, in an LIS program, it would be, uh, you know, focusing on some of those skills um, 
you know, some, some soft skills, um, but also, like I said, pre presenting, speaking. You know, I was on, I was involved in about 20 Zoom, WebEx, Skype calls last week. Um, this is my third one for today. So what I'm sharing with you is that, you know, those are things that my staff are also experiencing that they, uh, you know, weren't familiar with, with, with doing. And Lisa, what about you? I mean, what about your staff? Well, I mean, like all the public library directors here, one day they were doing story time in house and the next day they were having to do it over Zoom. This is, as Kelvin said, this is a different skill set. Um, what we have found is that um, we're relying not just on our li librarians, but also on our support staff to help to do some of the um, the the sort of the the media type stuff to help produce um, these story times. I, I'm a firm believer is I know that you can do just one big Zoom story time for everybody, but I want to you know we have uh, 50 libraries over you know, 2,500 square miles. I want that connection between the librarian and the city to remain. So it's important that all of our libraries are, um, librarians are, are reaching out to their communities. So I don't, what I, what I don't want to happen is, you know, I know it's more efficient to do just do one big Zoom presentation, but I am also worried about the connectivity between the library and the city, because all of our cities are different, and I don't want to lose that that ability to reach out to our to our residents, because you know some of our residents need us more than others. Some need to actually come in, but we also need to keep that connection up during this pandemic. So um, I think that I'm starting to get toward my last question, and so I'm going to pivot now, because um, I'm very interested. And Lisa just opened the door on this in the library as place. Um, it's always been important to people in a community. And um, during my tenure as ALA president, I continually talked about the fact that libraries were less about what we had for people and more about what we did for and with people. So that you know has a connotation that you come to us. And what do you think about long-term recovery and as libraries do re as libraries reopen will we establish and reestablish as the center of community life and learning and lisa i'll let you go on and then others will continue well, i hope so because we just finished a capital campaign we've got 50 beautiful buildings um as you said sari um our, we were so much based on library as place, come in where your living room, relax, uh, connect, start your small business here. And that all was sort of taken away from us uh, March 13th. So I want to get back to us, particularly in our communities of, of, of color where we're, we know that we serve an important role for, we're the first place an immigrant will meet government. And I don't want to lose that, those connections. Um, but I, I don't know what's going to happen. I suspect we're going to go back. Um, we're going to lose some people permanently who just, for whatever reason, have discovered digital, and that's okay. But it's also important that the library still remain um, a place a physical place that people can come into, even if it's just to pick up a book outside or to spend hours on the internet. So I, I don't want to lose that, um, that, that, that function that we have, especially, you know, I have rural libraries too. And sometimes we are the only center, community center in these rural communities, the public library. Kathy, I'm sure you would agree with that, but is there something you'd like to add? Literally, right now, on the other side of this wall, we have a entrepreneurial group. It's tonight's their first class. And so again, the library has a place. We did such a good job with that message that during this pandemic, I had this group reach out to me of retired professionals needing a place to hold their class. They're here at the library, and these are a group of nine people that are going to start up new entrepreneurs right here in our community, starting up new businesses. 
literally just today took a phone call from our county's career tech high school. They're looking for satellite locations. They don't have enough space in their buildings to socially distant and hold their classes. And so the library, again, as a place, we can do that here safely. And they're able to reach those 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 uh, students right here in this community. So it's a win win. Thanks and to great Romero, leadership. I know what the library means in your community because I visited. Right. Absolutely. And um, I want to believe that, yes, that libraries will continue to be that place for communities. And, and I'm encouraged by the fact that even today we get a lot of calls and requests and even our city leaders, because we're a municipal uh, library system, when are you going to open the libraries? We want to come back. We want to participate in programs. We want to browse collections. So that suggests to me people are eager to come back and and have that connection with the library. But I worry about the psychological impact of COVID-19 and, and the fact that we may lose some segments of our community, um, not lose, but they they may not see libraries in the same way uh, that they did prior to the pandemic. And very much what's happening in commerce, people are getting used to now getting their food, uh, their groceries delivered at home, their food and, and doing their shopping online. And obviously that has an impact on behavioral uh, tendencies or trends. And so I'm, I'm, for me, I'm still kind of gauging that that impact, but my hope is that libraries will resume to be that that third place for our communities. And uh, Romaro, I, I I couldn't agree more because I think about um, when you think of the library as being an errand, you know, for some people, um, maybe they stayed and lingered, but um, is do we expect everything to be delivered in one way or another, you know, digitally or physically? But um, I'm going to let Kelvin have the last word in my question <laughs> segment because I also think of the library's place as critical to bringing a diverse community um, together. That it was, it has always been a place where people of color joined, you know, joined together with others to um, make, a, make a better community than existed before. So I'm gonna let Kelvin have the last word on this. Well, thank you, Sari. So, you know, as, as I was listening to my colleagues speak, I was thinking about that I, I still believe, uh, even though, you know, I, I believe the library is everywhere, as I said, you know, these buildings as well as outside, but certainly these buildings, the buildings that we have, they're a destination. So continuing to make them a destination, you know, libraries being the center of culture, not just for uh, consumption and instruction, but about the community. We're the collaborators, we're the conveners. We're the ones who can continue that, um, continue those initiatives that are in our communities help solve the problems. That's that's that piece that let libraries play a role in. A couple of examples that I'll leave everybody with is about how Broward County is specifically doing that. Next week, we're having our Vet Fest, our Veterans Festival at the African American Research Library and Cultural Center. So it's gonna be an outside festival. Um, and then we are also going to be giving away turkeys and food to the veterans, to people that live in the community. As I said, in a socioeconomic uh, uh, poor community um, the, uh, that where the African American Research Library is, is located, these are the things that libraries can be uh, a part of and are a part of. Um, and this is what brings people to us. Currently, the uh, the elections, the early elections are taking place at 12 of our library locations. People are in our libraries right now. So um, again, having them come and be, you know, we're, we're a part of the democracy. We're part of, you know, uh, everybody's life. Um, and so whether you're just coming in to browse, uh, use the computer, just sit down to, uh, you know, just to sit down and rest uh, from, the, from the floor to heat, the libraries are, are here for you. Um, 
That's a great way to um, turn it back to Andrew. And I just thank you all so much. I mean, the future looks very bright to me with your leadership. Thank you very much. At some point, I'm going to realize <laughs> I'm going to get better at doing that. Uh, so, so listen, thank you all. And thank you, Sarah, for that great discussion. Um, you know, it's always seemed to me that one of the key stumbling blocks to creating a better functioning digital library market is was the lack of communication or the lack of collaboration, shall we say, between libraries and publishers around accepted market data. Now, I'm sure many people watching today's webinar are aware of, of Project Panorama, which was a collaborative effort initially underwritten by our sponsor today, Overdrive, to gather data about how, how libraries fit into the broader media consumption landscape. Well, in December, Panorama is going to release an extensive consumer survey on immersive media and reading. Uh, that's going to be next week on Thursday at November 5th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. You can mark that down. Uh, that's when the webinar and it will, will take place. And it will include uh, partners from the Book Industry Study Group and also the ALA. And they're going to preview data that they've collected through the survey ahead of the study's release. But ahead of that report, I caught up with the project lead for the survey, Professor, Professor Rachel Nurda from Portland State University, and recorded this short little interview. So I'm going to ask you to take a look at this now, and then we're going to come back and talk for a couple of minutes about it on the other side and wrap things up. So I'm going to ask our producer, Rob, to show the video. Rachel, thank you for joining us today with an early glimpse at the results of a survey that you're working on with Project Panorama on immersive media and reading in 2020. So I, I understand that the aim of the survey is to get data on how books fit into the larger media ecosystem, and certainly during this pandemic year, uh, and, and how media consumption, I think, is probably surging. I know my own is. Um, give us a sense of the study. How big is it? And is there anything that you know strikes you from the first wave of data? Yeah, it's important to us that the survey is nationally representative. And we've done several things to ensure that. So there's a really large sample size, 3,850 for the two waves. Um, we're also looking at quotas. So for race, age, region, um, things like that, we want to make sure that they are reflective of the demographics of the US. And although this is a cross-media consumer survey, and that's very important to us, uh, books are at the heart of the survey. The screening question, that survey respondents have to say yes to, to take the survey is, have you engaged with at least one book within the last 12 months? What strikes me within this first wave is how connected the different media types are. It's interesting that um, respondents are telling us consumption from one form leads to discovery in another form. So from books to TV to games and um, vice versa. And um, in terms of how, uh, how consumers are finding uh, media recommendations from friends, family, and social media remain the top ways of discovering new things across the board, so across books, shows, and games. Great. So, you know, one of the wonders, I think, of this pandemic year so far is that book sales through the th first three quarters of the year are actually up pretty robustly, about 6.2% over 2019. And consumer ebook sales are also up about 10%. And this after consumer ebook sales have been sort of a steady decline for the past five or six years. You know, at the same time, bookstore sales, actually people actually going into stores, well, those sales are understandably down. Um, and that suggests that people are getting, on the one hand, quite comfortable getting their reading materials uh, elsewhere, digitally, for example. And it's generating a lot of concern, I think, for indie bookstores as well. Um, anything in your data that speaks to these trends? Is this a trend that we're seeing accelerated during the pandemic or something new? Yeah, within this first wave of responses, we're seeing where people are usually finding books. And that's number one, being in browsing online bookstores, number two, browsing brick and mortar bookstores, and three, from in-person author events. And number one is not too surprising, particularly given that we're in a pandemic. Um, number two and three are both encouraging and alarming. Um, encouraging because clearly brick and mortar is still a place for discovery, but 
It's also alarming given that um, we're in this space where everything is so disrupted right now. Um, one thing that's very encouraging about independent bookstores from the first wave of the survey is about um, indie bookstores have been said to be storefronts for Amazon in the past. But what we're finding is that actually from this first wave, there's a greater proportion of consumers who bought a book in a bookstore after they first found it online than those who bought it online after they first found it in a bookstore. So that's been interesting. That is interesting. Another goal of the study, as I understand it, is to sort of better understand the role of the public library uh, in discovery and in consumption and purchasing habits of readers. And we, of course, have seen lots of anecdotal evidence over the years about how libraries uh, actually boost purchases. It's an age old question. Um, I know you're still parsing data, but do you have any insight into that? Yeah, the data is definitely showing that libraries drive sales, which is very exciting and encouraging. Um, if a book is unavailable at the library, respondents are telling us that the top things that they do are, one, they put themselves on the hold list, which makes sense, but the other two um, top things are that they buy it online um, at a bookstore or they um, buy it at their local bookstore. So driving directly to sales there. And, um, we're also seeing that almost 40% of the respondents bought a book after they first found it in their library. So um, we're already seeing from this first wave some interesting things showing that uh, libraries do um, lead to discovery and lead to book sales. And we're excited to see more of that come through as we analyze the second wave. Great. So we are an industry that is awash in data. We are a society that is awash in data these days. But the thing about data is that it, it could be a blunt instrument, right? You could use data to pretty much back up any position that you have. And I think one of the things we've seen in the industry is that we're not always all working off the same data. Amazon, for example, has its own data that they don't share with anybody. Publishers have their data that they don't often share. Um, libraries could have a ton of data, but of course they choose to protect their, their patrons' privacy. Um, one of the interesting things about this study is that you've got ALA and Book Industry Study Group and the Authors Guild involved with you. Um, and, and I wonder, how important is it to have this kind of buy-in, uh, this kind of collaborative effort? And you, you're working with these groups. You know, do you see an opportunity for this kind of study to bring everyone together around the table? Do you think we'll see more of these kinds of efforts going forward? Collaboration really is key. And I, I so hope that there's more of these efforts going forward because we need transparency and we need a baseline to go from. There's of course, proprietary data as, as you say that Amazon and libraries and bookstores and publishers are all going to have and work from and continue to do so. But our industry lacks that transparency and really needs something in, that for discussions and for policy, we need a baseline. And this really was the starting point for thinking about this survey and the need um, that it fills. The collaboration has been really exciting. Um, I've We've been really fortunate to work with BISG, IBPA, Authors Guild, and PubWest. And all of these entities have come together on the research committee to help make the survey questions more robust but also to make sure that the questions that we're asking don't just interest one group, one particular segment of the industry, but are of interest across the board. And that's really the kind of research that we wanna see more of. Great. So of course we have a webinar coming up on November 5th, 1 p.m. EST. We'll have more information about that coming out. When are we gonna see the full study and any final thoughts briefly about what's in there? Yeah, so right now we're working on, we've just started collecting the second wave of survey data, and then we'll be analyzing that. So you can expect to see results from the survey in early December. Um, and I hope, of course, to, to see you all in the, the webinar in November as well. Um, and yes, in terms of what we hope to see and find, um, we're looking at how COVID has impacted things, but also trends that transcend COVID and to look at the what of what is happening, what consumers are um, purchasing, but also the how, the where, and I think one of the most important things, the why of consumption. Those are some of the most important things um, to think about right now. Great. Rachel Norda, Portland State University, thank you for your time today.
Thanks, Andrew. So I'm very keen in seeing the study when the full data is out, but I'm gonna seize on one key point here for the panel uh, at the very end there. I, I agree with Professor Nora that collaboration for data, for a baseline across the entire reading ecosystem really is key. Uh, and in a world where everything nowadays seems to be streamed and consumers increasingly expect the seamless experience and you know, a world in which we must, from a public health perspective, rethink the way our libraries function, it, it seems to me that sliding back to a post-pandemic world in which the library, in which library users are, are punished for choosing to read digitally, forced to wait longer on holds lists, well, and the, the management and the budget pressure on libraries has ratcheted it up too, well, I'm just not sure that's tenable. So with so much competition for our attention, is making library digital access more difficult, holds less longer, is that not a recipe for losing readers and perhaps weakening a key institution, the public library, uh, that we're gonna need probably more than ever in helping us to recover from this pandemic? Now, I think we all understand uh, the need to protect indie bookstores uh, and the need to support authors and publishers. I don't think no, no one more than libraries because Frankly, it's the love of books and authors that I think bring people to work in libraries in the first place. So a long way to get to the closing question for our panelists. Are there any leverage points that you have identified during this pandemic that can help you make the case for more reasonable, sustainable pricing and terms in the digital market? Do we need government to bring everyone to the table? Uh, do we need to regulate a player like Amazon? Lisa, I know, you were one of the libraries that stopped buying new, new release Macmillan eBooks when they were doing its embargo. Was that effective? Should market actions be on the table? Um, or should, as I've heard many librarians suggest, should we stop chasing the bestsellers and start working with and elevating those publishers and authors who are committed to being good partners? So surely this forced digital expansion is, is showing us something. So any thoughts on how we use what has been nothing short of a national tragedy, this pandemic, to do something good, which is reset the conversation around digital live content in libraries? Uh, Lisa, I invoked your name, I so I'll start said, with you. I, I wanted a, a Gates, Carnegie kind of uh, infusion of, of readership. Give us money. Uh, we'll take it. I, I will say the one thing that about this video that I thought was really compelling that we we knew and one of the reasons why we were so angry with Macmillan is the false premise that people read in one way. Readers are readers. They read online, they buy books, they love to read. And so the sort of naive idea that you're you're if you read if the library lends it out to you digitally, it's going to affect my sales of books. That's not the case as this study has now showed us. Um, the the solution i mean i i think that libraries have come to the table we stepped up uh but you know we're, we're a lot of us are going to be in a tough place because um our economies our funding agencies are in stress and typically a library is not funded in a way that a police or fire department is i think though that people are relooking at how we fund government and maybe that's going to help us where we're not going to already automatically go to a public safety model first. We're looking at social services. Quite honestly, a library is a social service. Uh, and so I'm hoping that maybe the reset that we're doing nationally, the national conversations we're having on how we fund uh, government is going to help us. I I'm hoping. Kelvin, any thoughts? That was fabulous what Lisa just said, all of it. But I would also add that at the same time that we um, are looking at, um, say, the big five publishers in Amazon, that we also take advantage of the indie, um, the indie authors uh, and the uh, and others that are out there that offer. Um, these uh, ebooks and audiobooks at a much low, lower cost that are just as uh, just as great as some of the the best sellers and materials that we buy from uh, from the great. larger publishers. Uh, Ramiro. Well, I, I would have to say that all of the above tactics that you alluded to will probably be needed to address the situation. 
certainly uh, action by Congress at the federal level, obviously, is one uh, strategy. And, and Calvin is leading the ALA working group on ebook. Uh, I expect that they will also identify additional strategies. But it boils down to, from my perspective, to resources. Uh, ebooks continue to be pricier and harder to provide because of the cost element. And libraries will be struggling with the budgets going forward because of the pandemic and the impact on cities and counties and districts as it pertains to revenue. So we're going to be experiencing some significant challenges. So I'm glad that we're having this conversation today uh, because it, it's timely and it's, we need to proactively be thinking of how to respond to those challenges where libraries will struggle to provide timely uh, access to uh, materials, e-content, as well as, as print that, as we're offering curbside right now, most libraries, uh, but there's only so many dollars available. And uh, so that's a significant challenge for public libraries. And we need to be talking more about how do we provide some relief to those libraries so that we can continue to provide timely access Okay, timely access to materials, um, because even now uh, people have to wait significant amount of time for their ebook title, um, and of course, curbside services have challenges as well. So, uh, all of the above uh, strategies that you identified will need to be explored and 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 advanced. Kathy, any thoughts? Well, you know, the number one rule of partnership for a library is, you know, who else do we share our patrons with? And so that's with the publishers. They should be a great partner. Nothing nothing matters what happened prior to the pandemic. You know, the data is very interesting to look at and, and looking at the spikes and the jumps. And I know I've had many aha movements, you know, over the last couple of days, but really none of that matters. It's, it's about going from exactly this point, looking at the clock, this point forward. And that's all we want to do. We all share the same love of reading. We share the, the, the need for a literate society. And with that, there isn't any reason in the world we can't come up with an equitable model for our, li for our public libraries. Um, we've already touched on this. What was, uh, what was offered in the past that we're currently using now is not working. Let's start a new conversation. Sari, you're a, a moderator today, but I'm going to draft you to answer this question as well, because you have a lot of thoughts and experience when it comes to this topic. What do you think? Can we reset the conversation? You... <laughs> Everyone's, I agree with what everyone said, but um, I, it's not about resetting the conversation. I think we have to come to the table as an equal partner. And I'm not sure that has ever happened. And when we come to the table as an equal partner, we have to um, certainly understand publishers and how they need to develop an effective business model because we want the publishing industry to be healthy, but they also need to understand the accountability that libraries must have for the dollars they spend. These are tax dollars. We are, exist for the public good, and therefore the exorbitant pricing cannot be justified to the public, even the public that reads digital content. So it's time to have a very um, serious and in-depth conversation around these issues. And also, even though libraries will anticipate budget reductions as a result of the pandemic, libraries provide a very stable source of income from publishers. We're pretty predictable year to year what we're going to spend on materials. So again, we need to make the case for that. And finally, if you've read my columns, you know that I don't think we can let the heat off of Amazon. I'm a person born and raised in the message of free access. And that doesn't mean that we don't pay for it, but it means we are entitled to the access in public libraries. And as long as Amazon denies us that access, 
we need to con to bring it to the public's attention. Very good, and I promise you that will be a subject in a future live from the Library Lounge event. We will we will talk about that. That is all the time that we have for today. I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank Lisa Ramiro. Uh, I want to thank Kathy and Sari and Kelvin. Our producer, Rob Simon, at first, uh, some programming notes. You can watch this and share this webinar. It'll be freely available on the Publishers Weekly website. Uh, and also, you can mark your calendars for November 24th, where our next Library Lounge, Live from the Library Lounge event, will be happening. And we will be talking about the policy and legislative landscape for libraries after the election. Um, so with all of that, I want to say thank you all for joining us. Please. Um, to all the library workers out there, stay safe. We thank you for your service. Uh, be well, mask up, save lives, uh, and vote. And we will see you back here on November 24th. Thank you. Thank you.